Chapter 12 2000 It is the day before Christmas. Ashima Ganguly sits at her kitchen table making mincemeat croquettes for a party she is throwing that evening. They are one of her specialties, something her guests have come to expect. Handed to them on small plates within minutes of their arrival. Alone, she manages an assembly line of preparation. First, she forces warm boiled potatoes through a ricer. Carefully, she shapes a bit of the potato around a spoonful of cooked ground lamb, as uniformly as the white of a hard boiled egg encases its yolk. She dips each of the croquets, about the size and shape of a billiard ball, into a bowl of beaten eggs, then coats them on a plate of breadcrumbs, shaking off the excess in her cupped palms. Finally, she stacks the croquets on a large circular tray a sheet of wax paper between each layer. She stops to count how many she has made so far. She estimates three for each adult, one or two for each of the children. Counting the lines on the back of her fingers, she reviews once more the exact number of her guests. Another dozen to be safe she decides. She pours a fresh heap of breadcrumbs on the plate, their color and texture reminding her of sand on a beach. She remembers making the first batches in her kitchen in Cambridge for her very first parties. Her husband at the stove in white drawstring pajamas and a t-shirt, frying the croquets two at a time in a small blackened saucepan. She remembers Gogol and Sonia helping her when they were small. Gogol's hand wrapped around the can of crumbs, Sonia always wanting to eat the croquets before they had been breaded and fried. This will be the last party Ashima will host at Pemberton Road. The first since her husband's funeral. The house in which she has lived for the past 27 years, which she has occupied longer than any other in her life, has been recently sold. A realtor's sign stuck into the lawn. The buyers are an American family. The walkers, a young professor new to the university, where her husband used to work, and a wife and daughter. The walkers are planning renovations. They will knock down the wall between the living and dining rooms, put an island in the kitchen, track lights overhead. They want to pull up the wall to wall carpeting, convert the sun deck into a den, Listening to their plans, Ashima had felt a moment's panic, a protective instinct wanting her to retract her offer, wanting the house to remain as it's always been, as her husband had seen it last. But this had been sentimentality speaking. It is foolish for her to hope that the golden letters spelling Ganguly on the mailbox will not be peeled off, replaced. That Sonia's name, written in magic marker on the inside of her bedroom door, will not be sanded, restained. That the pencil markings on the wall by the linen closet, where Ashok used to record his children's height, on their birthdays will not be painted over. 
Ashima has decided to spend six months of her life in India, six months in the States. It is a solitary, somewhat premature version of the future she and her husband had planned when he was alive. In Calcutta, Ashima will live with her younger brother, Rana, and his wife, and their two grown, as yet unmarried daughters, in a spacious flat in Salt Lake. There she will have a room, the first in her life intended for her exclusive use. In spring and summer, she will return to the Northeast, dividing her time among her son, her daughter, and her close Bengali friends. True to the meaning of her name, she will be without borders, without a home of her own, a resident everywhere and nowhere. But it's no longer possible for her to live here now that Sonia is going to be married. The wedding will be in Calcutta, a little over a year from now, on an auspicious January day, just as she and her husband were married nearly 34 years ago. Something tells her Sonia will be happy with this boy. Quickly, she corrects herself. This young man. He has brought happiness to her daughter in a way Maushumi had never brought it to her son. That it was she who had encouraged Gogol to meet Maushumi will be something for which Ashima will always feel guilty. How could she have known? But fortunately, they have not considered it their duty to stay married, as the Bengalis of Ashok and Ashima's generation do. They are not willing to accept, to adjust, to settle for something less than their ideal of happiness. The pressure has given way, in the case of subsequent generation, to American common sense. For a final few hours, she is alone in the house. Sonia has gone with Ben to pick up Gogol at the train station. It occurs to Ashima that the next time she will be by herself, she will be traveling, sitting on the plane, for the first time since her flight to meet her husband in Cambridge in the winter of 1967. She will make the journey entirely on her own. The prospect no longer terrifies her. She has learned to do things on her own. And, though she still wears saris, still puts her long hair in a bun, he is not the same Ashima who had once lived in Calcutta. She will return to India with an American passport. In her wallet will remain her Massachusetts driving license, her social security card. She will return to a world where she will not single-handedly throw parties for dozens of people. She will not have to go to the trouble of making yogurt from half and half and sandesh from ricotta cheese. She will not have to make her own croquets. They will be available to her from restaurants, brought up to the flat by servants, bearing a taste that, after all these years, she has still not quite managed, to her entire satisfaction, to replicate. She finishes breading the final croquet, then glances at her wristwatch. She is slightly ahead of schedule. She sets the platter on the counter next to the stove. She takes a pan out of the cupboard and pours oil in.
several cupfuls to be heated in the minutes before her guests are expected. From a crock, she selects the spotted spatula she will use. For now, there is nothing left to be done. The rest of the food has been prepared, sitting in long, corning ware pans on the dining room table. Dal coated with a thick skin that will rupture as soon as the first of it is served. A roasted cauliflower dish, eggplant, a korma of lamb, sweet yogurt and pantuas for dessert sit on the cupboard. She eyes everything with anticipation. Normally cooking for parties leaves her without an appetite, but tonight she looks forward to serving herself, sitting among her guests. With Sonia's help, the house has been cleaned one last time. Ashima has always loved these hours before a party. The carpets vacuumed, the coffee table wiped with pledge. Her dimmed, blurry reflection visible on the wood, just as the old television commercial used to promise. She roots through her kitchen drawer for a packet of incense. She lights a stick by the flame of the stove and walks from room to room. It's gratified her to go to all this effort to make a final celebratory meal for her children, her friends. To decide on a menu, to make a list and shop in the supermarket, to fill the refrigerator shelves with food. It is a pleasant change of pace, something finite in contrast to her current, overwhelming, ongoing task to prepare for her departure, picking the bones of the house clean. For the past month, she has been dismantling her household piece by piece. Each evening, she has tackled a drawer, a closet, a set of shelves. Though Sonia offers to help, Ashima prefers to do this alone. She has made piles of things to give to Gogol and Sonia, things to give to friends, things to take with her, things to donate to charities, things to put into trash bags and drive to the dump. The task both saddens and satisfies her at the same time. There is a thrill to whittling down her possessions to little more than what she had come with, to these three rooms in Cambridge in the middle of a winter's night. Tonight, she will invite friends to take whatever might be useful, lamps, plants, platters, pots and pans. Sonia and Ben will rent a truck and take whatever furniture they have room for. She goes upstairs to shower and change. The walls now remind her of the house when they had first moved in. Bare, except for the photograph of her husband, which will be the last thing she will remove. She pauses for a moment, waving the remains of the incense in front of Ashok's image before throwing the stick away. She lets the water run in the shower, turns up the thermostat to compensate for the terrible moment when she will have to step onto the mat on the bathroom floor, unclothed. She gets into her beige bathtub behind the crackled sliding doors. She is exhausted from two days of cooking, from her morning of cleaning, from these weeks of packing and dealing with the sale of the house. Her feet feel heavy against the fiberglass floor of the tub. 
For a while she simply stands, and before tending to the shampooing of her hair, the soaping of her softening, slightly shrinking, fifty-three-year-old body, which she must fortify each morning with calcium pills. When she is finished, she wipes the steam off the bathroom mirror and studies her face, a widow's face. But, for most of her life, she reminds herself, a wife, and perhaps one day, a grandmother, arriving in America, laden with handmade sweaters and gifts, leaving a month or two later, inconsolable, in tears. Ashima feels lonely, suddenly, horribly, permanently alone, and briefly, turned away from the mirror, she sobs for her husband. She feels overwhelmed by the thought of the move she is about to make to the city that was once home and is now in its own way foreign. She feels both impatience and indifference for all the days she must live. For something tells her she will not go quickly as her husband did. For thirty-three years she missed her life in India. Now she will miss her job at the library the woman with whom she has worked. She will miss throwing parties. She will miss living with her daughter, the surprising companionship they have formed. Going into Cambridge together to see old movies at the Brattle, teaching her to cook the food Sonia had complained of eating as a child. She will miss the opportunity to drive, as she sometimes does on her way home from the library, to the university, past the engineering building where her husband once worked. She will miss the country in which she had grown to know and love her husband. Though his ashes have been scattered into the Ganges, it is here, in this house, and in this town, that he will continue to dwell in her mind. She takes a deep breath. In a moment, she will hear the beeps of the security system, the garage door opening, car doors closing, her children's voices in the house. She applies lotion to her arms and legs reaches for a peach-colored terry cloth robe that hangs from a hook on the door. Her husband had given her the robe years ago for a Christmas now long forgotten. This too she will have to give away, will have no use for when she is going. In such a humid climate it would take days for such a thick material to dry. She makes a note to herself to wash it well and donate it to the thrift shop. She does not remember the year she had gotten the robe, does not remember opening it or her reaction. She knows only that it had been either Gogola or Sonia who had picked it out at one of the department stores at the mall, had wrapped it even. That all her husband had done was to write his name and hers on the to and from tab. She does not fault him for this. Such omissions of devotion, of affection, she knows now, do not matter in the end. She no longer wonders what it might have been like to do what her children have done, to fall in love first rather than years later.
to deliberate over a period of months or years, and not a single afternoon, which was the time it had taken for her and Ashok to agree to wed. It is the image of their two names on the tag that she thinks of, a tag she had not bothered to save. It reminds her of their life together, of the unexpected life he, in choosing to marry her, had given her here, which she had refused for so many years to accept. And though she still does not feel fully at home within these walls on Pemberton Road, she knows that this is home nevertheless the world for which she is responsible, which she has created, which is everywhere around her, needing to be packed up, given away, thrown out bit by bit. She slips her damp arms into the sleeves of the robe, ties the belt around her waist. It's always been a sh bit short on her, a size too small. Its warmth is a comfort all the same. There is no one to greet Gogol on the platform when he gets off the train. He wonders if he is early, looks at his watch. Instead of going into the station house, he waits on a bench outside. The last of the passengers board the train doors slide to a close. The conductors wave their signals to one another. The wheels roll slowly away. The compartments glide forward one by one. He watches his fellow passengers being greeted by family members, lovers reunited with entangled arms, without a word. College students burdened by backpacks, returning for Christmas break. After a few minutes, the platform is empty, as is the space the train had occupied. Now Gogol looks onto a field, some spindly trees against a cobalt twilight sky. He thinks of calling home, but decides he is content to sit and wait a while longer. The cool air is pleasant on his face after his hours on the train. He had slept most of the journey to Boston, the conductor poking him awake once they had reached South Station, and he was the only person left in the compartment the last to get off. He had slept soundly, curled up on two seats, his book unread, using his overcoat as a blanket pulled up to his chin. He feels groggy still, a bit light-headed from having skipped his lunch. At his feet are a duffel bag containing clothes a shopping bag from Macy's with gifts bought earlier that morning before catching his train at Penn Station. His choices are uninspired. A pair of 14 carat gold earrings for his mother, sweaters for Sonia and Ben. They have agreed to keep things simple this year. He has a week of vacation. There is work to do at the house. His mother has warned him. His room must be emptied, every last scrap either taken back with him to New York or tossed. He must help his mother pack her things, settle her accounts. They will drive her to Logan and see her off as far as airport security will allow. And then the house will be occupied by strangers, and there will be no trace that they were ever there, 
no house to enter, no name in the telephone directory, nothing to signify the years his family has lived there, no evidence of the effort, the achievement it had been. It's hard to believe that his mother is really going, that for months she will be so far. He wonders how his parents had done it, leaving their respective families behind, seeing them so seldom, dwelling unconnected in a perpetual state of expectation, of longing. All those trips to Calcutta he had once resented. How could they have been enough? They were not enough. Gogol knows now that his parents had lived their lives in America in spite of what was missing. With the stamina he fears he does not possess himself. He had spent years maintaining distance from his origins, his parents, in bridging that distance as best they could. And yet, for all his aloofness towards his family in the past, his years at college and then in New York, he has always hovered close to this quiet, ordinary town that had remained. For his mother and father stubbornly exotic. He had not travelled to France as Maushumi had, or even to California as Sonia had. Only for three months was he separated by more than a few small states from his father, a distance that had not troubled Gogol in the least until it was too late. Apart from those months, for most of his adult life, he has never been more than a four-hour train ride away. And there was nothing, apart from his family, to draw him home, to make this train journey again and again. It had been on the train exactly a year ago that he had learned of Maushumi's affair. They were on their way up to spend Christmas with his mother and Sonia. They had left the city late, and outside the windows it had been dark. The disturbing pitch black of early winter evenings. They were in the middle of a conversation about how to spend the coming summer whether to rent a house in Siena with Donald and Astrid, an idea Gogol was resisting, when she had said, Dimitri says Siena is something out of a fairy tale. Immediately a hand had gone to her mouth, accompanied by a small intake of breath, and then silence. Who's Dimitri? he had asked. And then, are you having an affair? The question had sprung out of him, something he had not consciously put together in his mind until that moment. It felt almost comic to him, burning in his throat. But as soon as he asked it, he knew. He felt the chill of her secrecy, numbing him, like a poison spreading quickly through his veins. He had felt this way only on one other occasion, the night he had sat in the car with his father and learned the reason for his name. That night he had experienced the same bewilderment, was sickened in the same way, but he felt none of the tenderness that he had felt for his father, only the anger, the humiliation 
of having been deceived. And yet, at the same time, he was strangely calm. In the moment that his marriage was effectively severed, he was on solid ground with her for the first time in months. He remembered a night weeks ago looking through her bag for wallet to pay the Chinese food delivery man. He had pulled out her diaphragm case. She told him she had gone to the doctor that afternoon to have it refitted, and so he had put it out of his mind. His first impulse had been to get out at the next station, to be as physically far from her as possible. But they were bound together by the train, by the fact that his mother and Sonia were expecting them. And so, somehow, they had suffered through the rest of the journey and then through the weekend, telling no one pretending that nothing was wrong, lying in his parents' house in the middle of the night, she told him the whole story about meeting Dimitri on a bus, finding his resume in the bin. She confessed that Dimitri had gone with her to Palm Beach. One by one, he stored the pieces of information in his mind unwelcome, unforgivable, and, for the first time in his life, another man's name upset Gogol more than his own. The day after Christmas, she left Pemberton Road with the excuse of his mother and Sonia that a last-minute interview had fallen into place at the MLA. But the job was a ruse. She and Gogol had decided it, that it was best for her to return to New York alone. By the time he arrived at the apartment, her clothes were gone, and her makeup, and her bathroom things. It was as if she were away on another trip, but this time she didn't come back. She wanted nothing of the brief life they had had together, and she appeared one last time at his office a few months later so that he could sign the divorce papers. She told him she was moving back to Paris, and so, systematically, as he had done for his dead father, he removed her possessions from the apartment, putting her books into boxes on the sidewalk in the middle of the night for people to take, throwing out the rest. In the spring, he went to Venice alone for a week. The trip he had planned for the two of them, saturating himself in its ancient melancholy beauty. He lost himself among the darkened, narrow streets, crossing countless tiny bridges, discovering deserted squares, where he sat with a campari or a coffee, sketching the facades of pink and green palaces and churches, unable ever to retrace his steps. And then he returned to New York, to the apartment they had inhabited together that was now all his. A year later, the shock has worn off, but a sense of failure and shame persists, deep and abiding. There are nights he falls asleep on the sofa without deliberation, waking up at 3 a.m. with the television still on. It is as if a building he had been responsible for designing had collapsed for all to see. And yet, 
he can't really blame her. They had both acted on the same impulse. That was their mistake. They had both sought comfort in each other, and in their shared world, perhaps for the sake of novelty or out of the fear that that world was slowly dying. Still, he wonders how he has arrived at all this, that he is 32 years old and already married and divorced. His time with her seems like a permanent part of him that no longer has any relevance or currency, as if that time were a name he had ceased to use. He hears the familiar beep of his mother's car, spots it pulling into the parking lot. Sonia is sitting in the driver's seat, waving. Ben is next to her. This is the first time he is seeing Sonia since she and Ben have announced their engagement. He decides that he will ask her to stop off at a liquor store so he can buy some champagne. She steps out of the car, walking towards him. She is an attorney now, walking in an office in the Hancock building. Her hair is cut to her jaw. She is wearing an old blue down jacket that Gogol had worn back in high school. And yet, there is a new maturity in her face. He can easily imagine her a few years from now with two children in the back seat. She gives him a hug. For a moment, they sat there with their arms around each other in the cold. Welcome home, goggles, she says. For the last time, they assemble the artificial seven-foot tree, the branches color-coded at their base. Gogol brings up the box from the basement. For decades, the instructions have been missing. Each year, they have to figure out the order in which the branches must be inserted. The longest ones at the bottom, the smallest at the top. Sonia holds the pole and Gogol and Ben insert the branches. The orange go first, then the yellow, then the red, and finally blue. The uppermost piece slightly bent under the white speckled ceiling. They place the tree in front of the window, drawing apart the curtains so that the people passing by the house can see as excited as they were when they were children. They decorate it with ornaments made by Sonia and Gogol in elementary school, construction paper candlesticks, popsicle stick, gourd size, glitter-covered pine cones. A torn Banarasi sari of Ashimas is wrapped around the base. At the top, they put what they always do, a small plastic bird covered with turquoise velvet with brown wire claws. Stockings are hung on nails from the mantel, the one put up for Maushumi last year, now put up for Ben. They drink the champagne out of styrofoam cups forcing Ashima to have some, too, and they play the Peri Como Christmas tape his father always liked. They tease Sonia, telling Ben about the year she had refused her gifts after taking a Hinduism class in college, coming home and protesting 
that they weren't Christian. Early in the morning, his mother, faithful to the rules of Christmas her children had taught her while they were little, will wake up and fill the stockings with gift certificates to record stores, candy canes, mesh bags of chocolate coins. He can still remember the very first time his parents had a tree in the house. At his insistence, a plastic thing no larger than a table lamp displayed on top of the fireplace mantel. And yet, its presence had felt colossal. How it had thrilled him. He had begged them to buy it from the drugstore. He remembers decorating it clumsily with garlands and tinsel and a string of lights that made his father nervous. In the evenings, until his father came in and pulled out the plug, causing the tiny tree to go dark, Gogol would sit there. He remembers the single wrapped gift that he had received. A toy he had picked out himself, his mother asking him to stand by the greeting cards while she paid for it. Remember when we used to put on those awful flashing colored lights? His mother says now when they are done, shaking her head. I didn't know a thing back then. <laughs>